Hello, uh, my name is Gopala Vasudevan. People call me Vasu for short. And today we're going to talk about uh, the inflation, interest rates, and exchange rates, how they are related. And how are they related? So some of the most important theories in international finance are the purchasing power parity. So that talks about the relationship between interest rates and sorry, inflation and exchange rates. We want to talk about the international Fisher effect, which talks about the relationship between nominal interest rates and exchange rates. And finally, we want to compare these three theories. That is, in Chapter 7, we talked about interest rate parity, and we, we want to compare that with the purchasing power parity and the international Fisher effect. So taken together, I think chapter seven and eight are some of the most important relationships in international finance. And you know, definitely want to make sure you are comfortable with this material because there's a very good chance you get something like this for the exam. Okay? It's quite a few questions, maybe three questions at least from these two chapters. Okay. So what are some of the questions we try to answer? Why do highly inflated countries tend to have weak home currencies? And I think we talked a little bit about this in chapter two as well as chapter four. What we do here is that we try to give it a more quantitative uh, view. Okay, so provide a simple explanation for the differences between interest rate parity, purchasing power parity, and international Fisher effect. So, like I told you, these are the three perhaps most important relationships in international finance. Okay, so let's talk about the first one. Uh, the purchasing power parity. So what is the purchasing power parity? It tells you the relationship between uh, exchange rates and inflation. Okay. So there are several ways you can do that. The first is the absolute form of purchasing power parity. Uh, and basically what it tells you is that without international barriers, consumers shift their demand to wherever prices are lower and prices of the same basket of goods in two different countries should be equal when measured in common currency. So what we are saying is that if you can buy an iPhone in the US for $600 and the exchange rate is one British pound is equal to 1.5 US dollars, the same uh, iPhone should sell in the UK for 400 British pounds. And the reason being that they have the same value or 400 uh, British pounds is equal to 600 US dollars. Okay. Now let's look at the second form which is the relative form of purchasing power parity and what it tells you here is that due to market imperfections prices of the same basket of products in different countries will not necessarily be the same when measured in a common currency. So in this case there are realistically there are other things that come into play and what are some of the other things some of the other things are government controls, the other is transportation cost, and so on. So mainly because of this, we are saying that the absolute form of purchasing power parity may not work in practice. However, the relative form of purchasing power parity, what it tells you is that the rate of change in prices should be somewhat similar when measured in common currency as long as transportation costs and trade barriers are unchanged. So we are not looking at the absolute value, we are looking at the change in the prices and how it is related to the exchange rates. Okay. So the purchasing power parity tells you the relationship between relative interest inflation rates and the change in the exchange rate. So what we have here is that the change in the exchange rate is given by 1 plus the inflation in the home country divided by 1 plus the inflation in the a foreign country. So for here, normally we assume that H stands for the inflation in the US and F stands for the inflation in the foreign country. So basically here, the change in the exchange rate is dependent upon 1 plus the inflation in the US divided by 1 plus the inflation in the foreign country minus 1. Now to make it even simpler, if you look at the change in the exchange rate, we are saying that depends upon the relative inflation rates. So I US minus I the foreign country. Okay. So this summarizes the purchasing power parity. Again, that's something we talked about in previous chapters. And what we said was when the US has relatively high local inflation, 
people in the U.S. will import more from abroad, and because of that, the value of the currency should go down, and it should go down by the same degree as the inflation differential. L relatively low local inflation, imports will decrease, exports will increase. So when the inflation in the U.S. is low, chances are you want to buy more from, uh, you want to sell more abroad because your people want to buy from you. At the same time, you will not buy from abroad. And because of this, the local currency should appreciate by the same degree as the inflation differential. The next one is, what happens if the local and foreign inflation rates are similar? If both the countries have the same inflation, the change in the inflation is going to be zero. And because of that, there should not be any effect on the currency value. So the exchange rate should not change. Okay. So let's look at uh, illustration of the purchasing power parity. So what we have here is, we have a change in the inflation. Okay, so that is what we have here. We have the change in the inflation, and we are talking about how it is related to the change in the exchange rate. So what we find here is that this is the y-axis is the difference in inflation levels, and the x-axis is the change in the foreign currency spot rate. And the purchasing power parity tells you that we should have a straight line relationship. Okay? So all the points should lie on the line. So as an example, if you pick point A, basically what that tells you is that the difference in inflation between the US and the foreign country is 4%. And because of that, the currency should, if the foreign inflation is lower, the currency should appreciate, in this case, by the amount. Okay. But uh, that's what we have here. IH minus IF is 4%, which tells you that the inflation in the U.S. is 4% higher than inflation in, let's say, the U.K. We can expect the dollar to depreciate against the foreign currency. Now, let's look at point B. So for point B, what it tells you is that the inflation in the U.S. is almost 5% lower than the inflation in the foreign country. Let's say that is Mexico. In that case, we can expect the U.S. dollar to appreciate by 5%. Okay, that's what we see here. Okay, So the change in the foreign currency spot rate is a negative 5%. Okay. Now, what you might see in practice is the purchasing power parity may not hold a lot of the time or more of the time. And if you look at a point C, what it tells you is that for point C, the change in the exchange rate is 1%, while the differential inflation is 4%. So the inflation in the U.S. is higher than the inflation in, let's say, Mexico by 4%. But what we see here is that the exchange rate has only increased by 1%. So that it means that purchasing power parity does not seem to be holding. Okay. Explain the theory of purchasing power parity. Based on this theory, what is the general forecast of the values of currencies in countries with high inflation. So basically, if you look at the purchasing power parity, what it tells you is that the change in the exchange rate depends upon the differential inflation. So if the inflation in the US is higher than inflation, let's say, in Europe, we can expect the dollar to depreciate. On the other hand, if the inflation in the US is lower than inflation, let's say, in Mexico, we can expect the dollar to appreciate against the Mexican peso. Okay. So that's what we see. Based upon this theory, what is the general forecast of the values of currencies in countries with high inflation? So what we are saying here is that if you are in a country with high inflation, so we talked about Brazil, Russia, India, China, all these countries have been growing fast, but they also have high rates of inflation. And what it tells you here is that whenever you are in a country with a high inflation, the purchasing power of the currency should go down, or the value of the currency should decline over time. Okay. Now, what are some of the limitations of the purchasing power parity, and why it may not hold in practice? Some of the reasons are substitutes are not available. So what that means is that, you know, right now, if you look at the U.S., a lot of our imports come from China. Now, if you look at Chinese economy, over the last eight years and so on, the economy has gone up very much. They have improved, people have more money, and so on. Now, as a consequence, what you also find is that the inflation is higher. 
So inflation has increased in China over the few years. Now, does that mean the currency is going down? The currency is not going down. And the reason why it may not be going down is because of two reasons. One is government controls. So the government can control the exchange rate. And the second is that if you are in the U.S., although prices have gone up by 20% or 30% in China, it's still a lot cheaper than perhaps manufacturing in the U.S. Okay. okay, so let's look at a couple of problems. So again, you might get some questions like this. As of today, assume the following information. The real rate of interest is 2% in U.S. and Mexico. The nominal interest rate is 11% and 15%. The spot rate is 0.2. The one-year forward rate is 0.19. Okay. So what is the question? Use the forward rate to forecast the percentage change in the Mexican peso over the next year. So if you look at the forward rate, the forward rate is 0.19 and the spot rate is 0.2. So if you're going to use the forward rate to forecast the exchange rate, this is what we have. So we are talking about the 0.19 is the forward price minus the spot price divided by the spot price. So there we are saying that the currency is expected to depreciate by 5%. Now use the differential in expected inflation to forecast the change in the Mexican peso over the next year. So here we are applying the purchasing power parity. And what does the purchase power parity tell you? It tells you that if you look at the in, uh, inflation in the two countries, that gives you an idea regarding the exchange rates. Okay, And here, what is the inflation in the U.S.? The inflation in the U.S. is 11 minus 2, 9%. And the inflation in Mexico is 15 minus 2, 13%. And that is what we are using here. If you look at the change in the ex, uh, exchange rate, that would be 1.09 divided by 1.13 minus 1, or a decline of 3.53%. Okay. Now, the opening of Russia's market has resulted in a highly volatile uh, uh, Russian currency. Russia's inflation has commonly exceeded 20% per month, and Russian interest rates exceed 150%, but this is sometimes less than the annual inflation. Explain why the high Russian inflation has put severe pressure on the value of the ruble and does the effect of Russian inflation on the decline in uh, ruble's value support the purchasing power parity? How might the relationship be distorted by political conditions in Russia? So what we are saying is that inflation is high in Russia and because of that, the purchasing power of Russian consumers should be declining. Okay? So people in Russia, they should be importing more products from outside countries, and that should in turn lead to a decline in the value of the ruble. And that is what we see here. The ruble's value should depreciate against the dollar and against other currencies. So the purchasing power parity tells you that in countries with high inflation, we can expect the exchange rate to decline. The value of those currencies should decline over time. But what we find is that it is supported to a certain extent, but it is not completely supported. And why is that not supported? That we find the general relationship, but the government in Russia is not going to allow the free movement of the currency. They are not going to allow free imports from abroad, and they will put restrictions to control the value of the currency. So the main reason why that happens is because the currency is not freely floating. So testing the purchasing power parity, how do people test for the purchasing power parity? So what the purchasing power parity tells you is that the change in the exchange rate it should depend upon the change in the inflation. So basically here, we, can, we have some charts. And all those charts are the US inflation versus inflation in Canada, the US inflation versus the Swiss inflation, the US inflation versus Japanese inflation, and the US inflation versus the British inflation. So we are looking at the percentage change in the exchange rate versus the change in the inflation, differential inflation. Now what we find here is that unlike the graphs we talked about before, we find here that almost all the points are 
flat and they are together so what this tells you is that the purchasing power parity may not actually hold in practice now what are some of the reasons why it does not hold one is that substitutes may not be available the second reason why it may not hold is because there could be government controls and perhaps a far more important reason why purchasing power parity may not hold in practice is because in chapter 7 we talked about interest rate parity and if interest rate parity is violated you can do something about it so as an investor you can make money you have an arbitrage opportunity on the other hand whenever purchasing power parity is violated as an investor you may not be able to do anything about it so that is perhaps the primary reason why you might find that purchasing power parity may be violated in practice so these are what we talked about we talked about the confounding effects and the fact that there are no substitutes okay so the next important theory we want to talk about is regarding the international pressure effect and what is the international pressure effect ife suggests that the nominal interest rate consists of two parts the real rate plus the rate of inflation and what does it imply currencies with high interest rates will have high expected inflation and will be expected to depreciate. So basically here, in the case of the international pressure effect, it talks about the relationship between the exchange rates and the interest rates. Okay? And what are the implications? Foreign investors will be adversely affected by the effects of relatively high U.S. inflation rate if they try to capitalize on high U.S. interest rates. So what we are saying is that, suppose you are in Europe and you find that interest rates in the US are relatively high so let's say if you deposit and buy bank, uh, the treasury bonds you can make let's say 5% versus 3% in Europe so if you convert and invest in the US you might make the 5% in the US dollars but the problem is when you convert your money back most of the profits you made might go away and the reason being that we are saying that because the interest rates are 2% difference and if it is due to inflation, we can also expect the US dollar to depreciate by 2%. So all said and done, there should be no difference between keeping your money in the Europe versus converting, investing in the US and taking your money back. Okay? So this tells you a more formalized mathematical uh, way to express the interest rate, uh, the international fissure effect. And here what we have is that the change in the exchange rate is given by 1 plus the nominal interest rate in the U.S. divided by 1 plus the nominal interest rate in the foreign country minus 1. Okay? Or to simplify, the change in the exchange rate depends upon the difference in the nominal interest rate. So what is the big difference here? When you talked about purchasing power parity, that dealt with exchange rates and inflation. In the case of the international pressure effect, that talks about exchange rates and nominal interest rates. So let's look at this case. Today's spot rate of the Mexican peso is 0.1. Assume that purchasing power parity holds. The U.S. inflation rate over this year is expected to be 7%, while the Mexican inflation rate over this period is expected to be 3%. Wake Forest Company plans to import from Mexico and will need 20 million pesos in one year. Determine the expected amount of dollars to be paid by the Wake Forest Company for the pesos in one year. So we are assuming that real rate is 2% in both countries and international pressure effect holds. So basically in this case, it's a US company that has to make a payment of 20 million Mexican pesos. And the exchange rate is 0.1. Now what they are trying to figure out is what is going to be the future exchange rate. And to figure out the future exchange rate, if we are going to assume that the international fisher effect holds, we can forecast the future exchange rate. So the future exchange rate is given by 1 plus the interest rate in the US divided by 1 plus the interest rate in Mexico. And you know, rather than take the percentage, you could again just find out the future value or the future uh, exchange rate. Okay? So let's do that. So you could find out what is going to happen to the peso and the value of the peso is going to be 1.07 divided by 1.03. Okay. 
So that gives you 0 0.1038. Okay, so that's a direct way. And once you have that, multiplying by 20 million gives you the answer. So this is perhaps a more straightforward way to look at this problem. So what we are saying here is that to find out the future exchange rate, all that we're going to do is take the current exchange rate, which is 0.1, and then multiply it by 1 plus the interest rate in the U.S. divided by 1 plus the interest rate in Mexico. So let's look at the international Fisher effect. So just like we talked about the purchasing power parity, what we have here is we have the nominal interest rate in the U.S., the nominal interest rate in the foreign country, and then we have a change in the export rate. So what we find here is that just like we talked about for the uh, the uh, the purchasing power parity, we should find a straight line relationship that tells you the relationship between the differential interest rates and the differential exchange rates. Okay. So what we have here is that a comparison of the interest rate parity, purchasing power parity, and the international pressure effect. And I think this is a very important diagram that brings together chapter 7 and chapter 8 and that talks about the similarities and the differences between these two. So the first one is the interest rate parity. So chapter 7 we talked about the interest rate parity. Now one thing you want to remember is that what is really important about the interest rate parity is that it tells you the relationship between the forward rate and the today's exchange rate. So that is the interest rate parity. So interest rate parity is the forward price divided by the spot price and that depends upon the interest rate in the US and the interest rate in the foreign country. The next one is the Fisher effect and when you look at the inter international Fisher effect again that talks about the interest rate in the US, the interest rate in the foreign country and then how it affects the exchange rates. So the big difference between the, for, the interest rate parity and the international Fisher effect is that both of them look at nominal interest rates, but in the case of the interest rate parity, we are talking about the forward price. In the case of the Fisher effect, we are talking about the future spot price. Now, in practice, they should be one and the same. Now, the last one is what about the purchasing power parity? The purchasing power parity here, they call it the Fisher effect. What it tells you is that it tells you the relationship between the exchange rates and the inflation. So the difference here is that we are talking about inflation and exchange rates. Okay. So these are perhaps the most important theories in international finance and for chapter 7 and 8 are really important from an exam point of view. So do review, you know, the problem sets I posted on my courses and make sure you complete the assignments by the due date. Okay, take care.